Hi everyone, so I'm Ronan and I'm happy to present a span constraint uh, planning for efficient exploration and exploitation in uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, this, in this work we focused on um, exploration and exploitation in the tabular case. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so a state-of-the-art uh, algorithm in this case, so it's online reinforcement learning, uh, is UCRL, uh, that stands for Upper Confidence Bound Reinforcement Learning. And this algorithm uh, for a finite MDP achieved the following uh, regret bound. So in high probability after T time steps, you have a regret that scales as D times S square root of AT, where S and A are the dimension of the state space and action space rep respectively. And D is the diameter. So just as a reminder, the diameter of an MDP is a measure of the dimension somehow, or how easy it is to navigate in the MDP. It corresponds basically to the shortest path between the two states in the MDP that are the most distant from each other. So in this eight by eight grids here, you see the two states that are the most distant in the two opposite corners, and the shortest path is the blue path. So the diameter is 40. And uh, it has been an open question uh, whether we can improve this kind of bound. So um, uh, the work of Batlet and Tewari in 2009 suggested that a nice alternative to the diameter could be the, the span of the optimal bias that has the advantage of always being bounded by D, as was proved in 2009. Um, and also it uh, takes into account the reward function as opposed to the diameter, which is purely based on the transition dynamics of the MDP. And so the authors in this paper suggested uh, Regal C, which is a pseudo algorithm um, that tries to scale with span of H star instead of D in the regret. Unfortunately, it was not implementable. And so what we did in this work is to introduce a new, a new algorithm called SCAD for span constraint algorithm uh, that scales instead of D as the minimum between C and D where C is a known uh, upper bound on the span of H star. So in this case, you need prior knowledge, but this is a, a first step. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Claire from Amazon Research in Berlin, and I'm happy to present this work on linear bandits under delayed feedback. So let's see this problem through the lens of this story dating problem. So Audrey wants to find her optimal date. And sequentially, she gets to observe a set of a finite set of candidates among, which she, uh, among whom she has to choose uh, to get someone, to take someone out for uh, dinner at a restaurant. And uh, when she goes to the restaurant, she waits for her date. But life is short, so she cannot wait forever. So after 15 minutes, she's going to leave the restaurant. And she will never know whether the date is going to come after, um, after those 15 minutes if she or he didn't come within those, this window of 15 minutes. So in the setting of linear bandits, Audrey actually wants to estimate her parameter theta that controls her reward function. But she cannot do it because of the bias that comes from the, the, the censored observation, censored by the delay and the, and the conversion window. So in this work, we suggest a um, new way of doing linear bandits under delayed feedback, and we kind of um, analyze the new exploration function that we need to, that we need to design in order, in order to handle the bias um, that comes from the delay. So please visit the poster number eight over there on the wall, on the wall to get some details on this work. Thanks. For it. Hello, everyone. I will introduce our work here. Mm. Our goal is to learn a policy for a specific player in a two-player zero-sum extensive game with perfect information. Our basic assumption is that a powerful opponent is given and we can play with it repeatedly. Uh, our, our intuitive insight is that a powerful opponent has some knowledge about his own policy space and we can uh, use it to guide our agent to explore efficiently in our own policy space. There are two main challenges in this, in this paradigm. The first is that sparse rewards are gained, are gained uh, due to the gap between a new agent and a, a powerful opponent. And the second is that brittleness, brittleness due to the fixed opponent, our agent may perform badly uh, against other opponents. 
uh, we propose a ladder point modeling as the figure showed. We introduce a ladder model to mimic the agent's policy. Mm, we, we train the ladder model and our agent into alternatively so that our agent can get rewards, can, uh, our agent can get tractable rewards. Uh, and also our, the ladder model also also uh, maximize his, 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 his own rewards so that our agent play with various opponents to gain robustness. Uh, we test our method on the reverse game. Uh, we compare our method with self-play method, model-based search, and imitation learning. And the pictures and the tables show that we can get robust policy uh, efficiently. Welcome to our poster. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ahmad Reza Momeni, and I'm a double PhD student from Stanford University. And this is a joint work with Jonathan Gore from the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for ac accommodating me giving this presentation in video. In this work, we introduce a model that extends the well-studied stochastic multi-arm bandit framework. Uh, we consider k arms that generate independent rewards from some fixed distributions no k for t time steps. We assume that before each time step t, one may observe eta k the number of samples from the distributions no k for each arm. Finally, as usual, the final goal is to study the minimax regret against an oracle that repeatedly chooses the best arm. Our first result establishes a lower bound on the regret. Notably, this bound is a decreasing log sum x function of the cumulative information arrivals. We observe that the lower bound captures a transition between the classical log t regret and constant regret. In fact, if there is no auxiliary information arrivals, one recovers classical regret rates. Nevertheless, existence of information flows can be leveraged to improve the regret rates. Finally, we note that the impact of auxiliary information increases when it arrives more frequently and earlier. We propose the following adaptive exploration method in the presence of unknown information flows. Essentially, it uses some virtual time indexes that are updated dynamically based on information arrivals. These virtual time indexes replace the time indexes often used by policies to exogenously determine exploration rates. Every time information on a certain arm arrives, the relevant virtual time index is updated using a carefully selected multiplicative factor here in the green equation. The general idea is illustrated in the figure as well. Based on these virtual time indexes, the algorithm compares the number of observed samples of each arm to a dynamic threshold to decide to whether explore or exploit. The algorithm reduces the exploration rates due to, um, to guarantee that the loss due to exploration and exploitation is balanced. So what do we know about this proposed approach? First, it achieves a record rate that matches the lower bound that was mentioned earlier. Secondly, it is actually just one example of a more broad policy design approach and can be followed to adjust classical map algorithms such as epsilon greedy and UCB1 to react to the arrival of auxiliary information flows that are a priori unknown. In addition, it achieves rate optimality for a broad class of endogenous information flows that may be reactive to the past actions of the policy. Finally, without any prior knowledge of the information flows, these algorithms can now adapt in real time to achieve the best performance, which is kind of a best of all worlds type of behavior. <coughs> Hi, I'm Trevor Darrow. I'm here for Deepak Pathak, who unfortunately couldn't make it with his poster, but I'm happy to give his spotlight in his place. We're interested in uh, discovering intrinsic rewards for, uh, for um, RL environments. Just to go back one slide, the key idea here is a large-scale study of what you can do with intrinsic rewards, at least large-scale in the sense of simulated environments. What can you do with um, curiosity alone? We're, uh, of course, in the paradigm of learning a policy to predict uh, what actions to take. We may have extrinsic rewards in the environment, and the question is, what can we do with uh, intrinsic rewards alone, especially those derived from some sort of dynamics-based um, curiosity uh, approach? Uh, hopefully, uh, curiosity is still an acceptable term, even though Zach has been railing against it in the, um, uh, in the debates. <clears throat> um, so in this uh, study reported in the paper uh, at, this, uh, at this workshop, we explore what kinds of representations 
uh, are uh, sufficient for a dynamic spaced curiosity model to have interesting quote unquote behaviors in Atari and other simulated environments. And uh, we look at pixels, autoencoder type VAEs, random projections and action projection predictions based on our previous work at ICML 17. The latter two work quite well. And what's amazing is you can get such, such in interesting behaviors just from intrinsic reward alone. All the Atari games, you can learn uh, interesting behaviors only with curiosity. These plots are in the paper. Uh, also for certain robo school environments, you can learn to walk, you can learn to play, and you can certainly learn to play uh, Mario. Um, crosses over t 10 levels without any reward. Um, interestingly, you might not learn how to get a great score. Uh, this curiosity-based approach to Pong learns to live forever, basically, learns to, to play until the simulator crashes, but it, it doesn't make any points, and that's sort of what you'd expect. There's no poster, but there's a URL on the back wall that, where you can look at these videos and look at the paper. Thank you. Hello everyone. So this work is done uh, jointly with uh, my colleagues in uh, MSR Montreal and uh, MSR Raymond. Uh, text-based games. Uh, in text-based games, uh, all of your observations are in a sequence of uh, tokens, words, and also the, the agent has to generate uh, also a sequence of uh, words to interact with the game environment. So uh, due to the time limitation, I'll just uh, talk a bit about our motivation. Um, so why text-based games? I think it's uh, one of the bridges uh, between language and RL. So for example, you need to uh, have the ability to uh, language understanding and uh, also uh, for example, knowledge acquisition. Uh, so in text-based games, uh, first uh, it's uh, partially observable, so you don't know what's happening in, uh, for example, uh, room T2. Uh, also, um, the action space uh, is combinatorial, uh, so it's a sequence of uh, words. And uh, use our uh, recently released uh, framework, Text World. We uh, created uh, this uh, simple task called Coin Collector. So it's uh, randomly connected chains of rooms, and uh, your task is to uh, go through the chain uh, with uh, there are there are destructor rooms. So you need to collect the coins. So if you are interested, uh, please go to our poster. Thanks. Uh, hi again. So now we'll talk about uh, online reinforcement learning with misspecified mis states. So uh, to illustrate the idea, let me take a very simple example. So the game of breakout. So uh, here I've um, displayed the three different uh, configurations. So the first configuration corresponds to the initial state when you start the game. The second one is a possible state that you can reach after playing for some time. Uh, but the last one, as you can see, so there is a, a hole in the brick wall, so it's not reachable from the initial uh, state. Uh, and this is what I call the misspecified state. So basically the problem with this kind of state is that uh, they induce um, an MDP with an infinite diameter, so the notion that I introduced in the previous presentation meaning that all algorithms that comes with theoretical guarantees in terms of regret, like UCRL or more recently optimistic PSRL, uh, will uh, fail to learn and will suffer linear regret. Uh, and so um, the idea of this work was to try to um, be able to achieve a square root T regret in this case without leveraging on any form of prior knowledge like uh, in the previous work on uh, spine constraint uh, algorithm. Um, so this was the question that we tried to address. And basically we come up with an algorithm that without any prior knowledge is able to achieve this kind of uh, bound, so square root of t. And instead of scaling with the diameter, it scales with um, basically the diameter restricted to a specific uh, communicating uh, area of the, of the MDP. If you're interested, uh, please come to our poster.
Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Lurch, and we're from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute over in Troy, New York. Um, who we are on a daily basis, we're cognitive scientists that use computational models to explain human behavioral learning, uh, with our current aim today to add capacity limits to reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, why would we want to add limitations? Um, by adding limits, this forces you to throw away information, um, prevents overfitting, and forces generalization. Surprisingly, we can show that these limited algorithms outperform their unlimited um, uh, capacity systems. And so uh, for the standard actor critic algorithm, uh, the goal is to learn a, an optimal value function uh, where you use the TD error to update both the policy and the value function. So here we consider this state to action policy mapping um, as an information channel in the Shannon sense where we place an additional constraint on information processing. Um, before we can define an optimal channel, we have to define the cost for taking a particular action in a given state. Um, where we consider this as the difference between the optimal value and expected value. Um, in this particular example, action one would cost you seven and action two would cost you nothing. And so we introduce this as the Bellman loss function. Um, so with a formal cost function defined, um, the goal becomes um, an optimization problem uh, where you want to minimize the expected cost between a state and action mapping um, subject to a limit on the information processing constraint. We call this the capacity limited actor critic. Um, and so we uh, applied this in a 2D grid world where the task is to navigate from a starting to goal position. Um, and what we find is that these uh, capacity constraints force the behavior to become more deterministic uh, along critical paths shown in blue and allow exploration to emerge in uh, states where errors are less costly shown in orange. Um, what we are also able to show is that this limited um, algorithm is able to outperform its unlimited counterpart in generalization tasks. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more, please stop by our poster afterward. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryota, and this is a joint work with Justus and Katja uh, on the screen. And um, in Q-learning, Ipsilon greedy is a common way of exploring, but have you ever set Ipsilon to zero? We show that it works. And it works if you make your network deep and nonlinear. So here I show uh, Ipsilon zero with no hidden layer, linear, one hidden layer, two hidden layers, and it, it starts to get better, and it's almost as good as the typical common Ipsilon decaying scheme that people use. And interestingly, this task is mounting car. It's simple enough that it can solve with a linear network, but in terms of representation power, we're not, uh, we don't need nonlinearity, but it seems to affect the, the optimization dynamics. We also tried this in the kind of river swimmer type of data set, but here we have two lanes. If you're a fish on the top lane, you have to swim left, and if you're a fish on the bottom lane, you have to swim right. And here we can also s confirm similar observation that linear, in this case, mean tabular tier learning. Again, in terms of expressive power, tabular tier learning is enough. But actually, by making the network more nonlinear, uh, we get better and better results. And with two hidden layers, we converge to an uh, uh, optimal solution. So there are a lot of things to discuss. Um, but first of all, stochastic exploration is not the only approach. There could be a deterministic alternative. Um, optimistic initialization is important. There is a randomness in the initialization of the network, but that doesn't explain everything. And our final thought is that linear networks might underfit and give up too easily. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, my name is Adrian. I'm going to tell you about some work I did with my supervisor, Aaron Covin and Mark Belmar. Um, so comb-based methods enjoy uh, nice theoretical guarantees for um, exploration. Unfortunately, they do not scale really well. There is some, some pole complexity increase at least linearly with the number of states, which means that you have to try at least every action in every state. And they are based on a state action visit count, which is usually not tractable for large state action space and usually sparse or equal to zero for most states. Um, so one, the first thing we advocate for is, is um, stale abstractions. So if you look at these two images, you can see that they do not match exactly in pixel space, but that you should, uh, you should apply the same action that would lead to the same reward, which is getting the key. 
And so that's the idea behind state extraction, is that you cluster together states that leads to similar rewards and transition. We found that when you use an abstraction for exploration, the counts go larger as the abstraction become coarser. Uh, it's allowed you to have faster exploration, but on the other side, you lose any guarantee that you might recover the optimal policy. So it's allowed you to trade off between the speed and the quality of the policy you, you want to learn. Um, now, if you want to actually estimate uh, counts, uh, pseudo counts were introduced uh, a few years ago as a way to introduce counts with the, to estimate counts using a density model. We found that the density model implicitly defined an abstraction and that if you use an exploration bonus using this pseudo count, it incentivizes you to explore within this abstraction. Um, unfortunately, the uncertainty with regard to the count um, might lead to over exploration, which means that your agent might take too long to explore, or under exploration, which means that exploration could fail. If you want more detail, come by our posters. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone, uh, I'm Thomas, and I'll talk about the potential of the return distribution for exploration. Um, so we have these two classic distributions, right? One is the return distribution from which we're sampling, and then either in a free twin test or Bayesian approach, you get a posterior distribution at the mean. And uh, people generally say, well, we shouldn't actually care about the return distribution because that's the irreducible part of the uncertainty, right? And what we should only care about is the posterior distribution of the mean. Well, this is true for supervised learning and banded setting, but it's actually not true for the sequential decision-making setting. And to make this a bit more clear, you could actually expand on the left side. The return distribution is induced by two sources of stochasticity. So one is indeed the environment, right? The stochastic transition model and reward model. And that's irreducible, and you do want to act on the expectation. But there's a second part, which is actually the fact that your future policy might still be stochastic, right? Especially in the beginning of learning. And that contributes to the return distribution as well. So for this paper, basically what we did is we said, now what if we assume a deterministic environment? Then the return distribution will entirely be induced by the future policy uncertainty, right? It's the only source that induces the fact that there's a return distribution. And then you can actually act optimistic with respect to it. Um, so what we do is we propagate return distributions actually in a similar fashion as was introduced last year at ICML. And then we're gonna act optimistic with respect to the distribution with the idea that we can actually achieve the best uh, at the upper end of that distribution. And we just see that this turns out to be actually very effective, and especially effective in domains where the true domain tree, the underlying tree, is asymmetric. And a good example is this chain domain that we've seen very often in uh, RL exploration research. But if you unfold that as a tree, you can see that it extends much deeper in one direction than another one. And MCTS and also these sort of local Bayesian methods, they're also very poor in this domain, because what you need to do is propagate uncertainty. And uh, well, there was already, an, uh, it's, we're not the first to come up with this idea. I mean, there was already a nice paper at this ICML main conference that propagated variance through the Bellman equation. But I do think it is sort of under-recognized that you need to propagate uncertainty. Uh, and what you can then see, and that's what our results especially show, is that you should take the depth below a certain action into account. So if I have a few counts and then the domain afterward terminates, that has a different interpretation than if I have the same number of counts all the way at the root of the domain. Um, so if you wanna know more then, uh, our paper's actually in the corner over there. Hi, uh, I'm Stephen Jackman. I'm here from the University of Michigan to present an algorithm for bounding regret in simulated games. So simulated games are often used to uh, simulate uh, complex and multi-agent interactions, such as the stock market. And in the context of a simulated game, uh, we care about the regret of a mixed strategy profile sigma, which is defined as the maximum amount any player can gain by switching from playing that profile to playing some other strategy. Uh, the difficulty is that in simulated games, the payoffs are random, so it's difficult to find uh, the regret directly. So our objective is to provide an algorithm that for a given uh, symmetric strategy profile returns a tight upper bound on its regret, minimizing the number of samples we take from the simulator. So we assume that what the simulator provides are samples of a deviating payoff, DI, which is defined as the payoff uh, of a player who deviates from the profile to some peer strategy I, while all other players continue playing the profile. Uh, if we have these, we can use them to calculate the payoff of playing the profile as the weighted average, and then calculate the gain from deviating uh, as the deviating payoff minus the payoff of playing the profile. The regret, which is what we care about, is then the maximum of all these gains. So the problem we end up with is similar to a best arm identification bandit because the regret 
uh, requires finding the best deviation. But the gain from deviating to strategy I depends on the payoffs not only for strategy I, but also for everything in support of the profile. So we can't allocate all our samples just towards finding the best deviation. Uh, for example, if we knew the optimal, if we knew the best deviation, we could calculate the distribution of samples among that set. So there's a trade-off between finding the best deviation and sampling to get a tight upper bound on a deviation. So our proposed algorithm uh, is an intuitive uh, UCB style algorithm that finds the deviation gain with the maximum upper bound of the current time step and then samples the payoff that reduces this upper bound the most, which intuitively combines the UCB style exploration with uh, the optimal allocation of samples. And then we've currently run some results on toy experiments uh, and our algorithm performs quite closely to the optimal uh, allocation of samples on those, but for more details, you can come see our poster over there. Thank you.